praise him this morning. Let's sing out to he who is worthy. Let's give him all of our praise. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing. And we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. What we'll say? We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, come on, let faith. Let faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise, let faith arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, come on, this is what? And this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Come on, praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Yeah, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Yeah, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. We praise you, we praise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall We cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we will see We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you, oh. Church. Let's just continue to repeat that, just declaring that this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. It is the body of Christ praising our Lord and our Savior together. So let's just declare that this morning. This is what living. And this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Yeah, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. Yes, Jesus, we use that. We use that freedom to worship you, God. 
to echo all of heaven, declaring that your name is the name above all names, the only one who is worthy. Jesus, we continue to worship this morning. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down on Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Come on, let's praise his name this morning, church. Oh, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ our King. Yeah. And oh, praise the name of the Lord. Blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' name. Oh, we look to you, Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Oh, we praise your name and oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our God come on sing it out oh praise Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord.
when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart you sing I'll bring you more I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself It's not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus King of Endless Word. King of Endless Word. No one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required you search You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart oh, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'll give you more than a song. More than a song Cause it's all about you, Jesus I'll give you more than a song More than a song Cause it's all about you, Jesus We open our hearts to you, Jesus Oh, have your way. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And it's 
Good morning, Heritage. Who's doing good this morning? And if you haven't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Pastor Luke. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Heritage, specifically overseeing and, and serving alongside our worship and creative arts team. Can we thank Josh and Caroline for leading us in worship this morning? Woo. Man, I just love my team. I love all the volunteers that give up of their time each and every week um, to create spaces like we just had, to meet with Jesus and honor him. Amen. Well, listen, um, you know, as Pastor Brian was, uh, was planning the Dwell series, he kind of approached me and was like, hey, Luke, here's the thing. I have this idea for a Dwell series, and the last week of the series is on worship, and I want you to preach. And at first, I was a little nervous. I was like, I don't know, but, but I knew the Holy Spirit was asking me to say yes. And as I did, I automatically just kind of came before the Lord and, and, and surrendered that to him and asked him to speak to our church, <clears throat> specifically that God would, would reveal to me what our church needs to know as it relates to worship. How are we called to worship? Now, I want to put some of your minds at ease, some of your thinking. We just got done worshiping for about 20 minutes. Is Luke going to sing for the next 30 minutes during the message time? If that is you, don't worry. I'm not going to break out in song. In fact, much of what we're talking about today as it relates to worship has little to do with music. Because although music is part of our worship, music should not be the culmination of our worship. Let me say that in another way. Music should not be the only way we worship God. You see, worship is not just about the songs that we sing. Here, I want to define worship for us this morning so we can all be on the same page as we talk about it today. So my working definition for worship is this. Worship is our response to God, both privately and publicly, with our lives. There's this beautiful thing that happens when we pursue God. He reveals himself to us. So the reality is, is God initiates and we simply respond with our lives both privately and publicly. That means that worship is not just a ritual or a set of actions. In fact, it's a posture of the heart, a reflection of our love, adoration, and reverence for God. So yes, worship encompasses not only our acts of praise and adoration when we gather here like we just did on the weekends, but it also includes, get this, living every day to honor him. 
That is our worship. Now, that's the first thing I want us to understand as it relates to worship, that it is a response. Here's the next thing I want us to understand, and then we're going to get into our passage today. The reason that you and I were created by God, the reason that you and I, I would say, even exist, is to allow our lives to be an offering of worship to God. Church, do you know that you were created by God to worship him? It's true. You are designed to worship. It's inside of you. It's what you do. Worshiping is what we were created to do. You see something and you respond to it. Even outside of our worship, we do that every day, don't we? We see something and we respond to it. But you see, there's a problem. And I want to pose this problem for us today. And that's the reality that not everything was created to be worshiped. Can I get an amen on that? Not everything was designed to be worshiped. But this is the problem, isn't it? And I believe it's a problem that's rooted deep in our flesh and in our our humanity. We see it all around us, don't we? People worship things like money. They worship their jobs. They worship entertainment, social status, political parties and candidates. You name it. But if we are a Christ follower, get this. If you are in Christ Jesus, then God commands you to worship him and him alone. Him and him alone. So I remind us again this morning, church, that God wants more than your song. And more than that, he commands those who are in Christ Jesus to worship him. So if God created us to worship, what does that look like? We're going to look at that today. What does God desire our worship to be and look like? What does it mean to worship God with all of our hearts? Man, God is faithful in his word. He always has answers for us, and it is the living, breathing word of God. And we're going to actually focus on what I believe is one of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture as it relates to worship and how to worship God with our whole heart. But can I ask us this morning, I don't know what you you came in here with, but is it your desire to, to worship God, to seek God with your whole heart? Well, praise be to God that I believe he wants to show us exactly how to do that through this story of a woman with an alabaster jar. Now, here's the thing. Um, I I went to school for ministry, and I vividly remember my homiletics class. If you don't know what that is, it's actually just a class on preaching biblically. And um, I remember my professor saying, You have to understand the context and culture of what's happening in the the scripture you're reading. You have to know what's happening before and after it, because here's the thing it all points to Jesus. So we're actually going to take a quick look at what was happening in Jesus' ministry before this story, because I think it's really important, and it will be very telling about what we understand about this passage. So actually, uh, Luke chapter 3 reminds us that Jesus actually began his ministry at the age of 30. And there are two main events that happened that kind of launched Jesus into his ministry here on earth. The first is this. He is baptized by his cousin John. And there are two things in that story that, that tell us that, that happened. And the first is that it says when he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove. The second thing, God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Right. And then right out of that, it's interesting, the next big event happens. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. And actually, the book of Hebrews tells us exactly why the Holy Spirit did this. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We know that Jesus overcame all temptation and was tempted in every way. Can I just make a side note? Isn't that amazing that that is the God we know and get to have a relationship with? That that he chose to experience and overcome everything we could ever feel, struggle with, or go through? That's a different sermon. We'll save that for another sermon, but let's keep going. After that, Jesus' ministry launches. Check this out. He begins to gather followers. They travel to different cities. They're teaching. They're doing miracles. They're casting out demons. They're correcting religious leaders. They're ministering to all kinds of people, sinful people, self-righteous people, the outcasts, the religious, you name it. And in that time, he's also calling people to himself. He's actually developing his core group of disciples, the 12 disciples, preparing them for ministry. So as we go into this story, know that Jesus' ministry is well on its way. Word is getting around about who Jesus is, what he is doing, and who he claims to be. All of that brings us to this story, to this moment, to a woman with an alabaster jar who demonstrates what it means to live a life of worship in response. 
So we're going to dig right into this passage, guys. Um, it's Luke 7, 36 through 50. So I would invite you, turn your Bibles there, follow along. You can even use your, your Bible app on your phone, or you can follow along on the screens. I'm going to read this story in its entirety, and I want you to focus on the woman in the story and how she's demonstrating what it means to live a life of worship, okay? So follow along, starting in verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman that she is, that she is a sinner. I love this. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. Does that not just move your heart? It's so hard to read that passage and not get emotional because church, I want to be like this woman when I worship him. I want to live my everyday life as a sacrifice of worship to God. But to really understand the depth of the story, we have to take a closer look. Can you guys do that with me today? We're going to take a deeper look. I want you to picture the scene. Jesus travels to Simon the Pharisee's home. And when he gets there, it says that he reclines at the table, likely surrounded by his disciples and other guests that were invited by the Pharisee. You see, the first thing I want us to realize from the text is this. And this is not a fill-in, but you can write it on the back of your note guide. Jesus was not invited to this Pharisee's home as an honored guest. He wasn't. We have proof of that in this story because in this culture and time, we have to understand that three things um, a host would do for their guest, right? The first thing is that if a guest came to their home, and this is anybody, it was customary, that they would put their hand on their shoulder and they would give them a kiss on the forehead as a sign of peace. The second thing that they would do is that they would wash their feet. Make no mistake, guys, people's feet were dirty back then. They traveled on long, dusty roads, And actually, there was a resource I even read that said that it would have been impossible to avoid all of the animal dung from traveling on the road. So Jesus' feet were filthy. So a guest would would wash their, 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 a host would wash their guest's feet as a sign of love and welcoming to them. The third thing that a host would do is that they would anoint their, their guest's head. And that, that, that oil would have had herbs and spices in it to kind of refresh them from their long and, and, and dusty travels. So those are things that that were customary. It was a sign of welcome and respect. This was normal for most circumstances, but especially for someone like a rabbi. And here's the thing. This Pharisee would have at least viewed Jesus as some sort of rabbi, but he didn't do any of these things, did he? So for Simon not to do any of these things lets us know that he had no interest in honoring Jesus, but likely his motive was either to take a look, a closer look at the man he heard was doing miracles or to challenge his teaching. 
Bottom line is this, guys. Simon did not see Jesus for who he was, and he, had, he certainly had no desire to honor him. But someone else, a woman with a relentless desire, makes it her mission to honor and praise Jesus. Can we take a closer look at this woman? Because this is powerful, guys. There are several accounts of this story throughout the Gospels. But Luke, in his, his kind of narration, goes without giving this woman a name. And I think that's actually very intentional. Because listen, I'm not sure who she was mattered it was what she did and her response to what she believed that mattered. Amen? Now, what we know for sure is that this, this woman was identified as a woman in the city who was a sinner. In, in the original language, that word for sinner would have meant a perpetual sin or an ongoing sin. So that means, we don't know for sure, but that means she could have been a prostitute. She could have been an unbelieving heathen. She could have committed a grave sin that the Pharisees kind of shunned her for. We don't know. What we know is that she was deemed sinful and viewed less than. And what did she do? She heard Jesus would be there and made it a priority to get to him. I want us to understand that her actions, guys, her, her entering the Pharisee's home, it was a huge risk for her because not only was she a sinner and everybody knew it, enter, entering a Pharisee's home, but she was a woman. And women in that time and culture were never allowed in the actual room of these events because religious customs in ancient Judea were very stri had very strict codes on on interactions with men and women in public settings. But this did not stop her. It didn't stop her. She came into the room knowing the potential consequences of what people would think. Then she approaches Jesus with reverence and humility, which leads us to our first fill-in today. That we're, we are to worship God with reverence and humility, just like this woman displays for us. Can you use your holy imagination for a moment with me? This passage is so powerful. Imagine what that moment must have felt like. I would like to think that as she entered the room, she gazed upon the face of Jesus and immediately felt a sense of trembling and awe. Church, as she walked across the room to where Jesus was sitting, I believe that her mind was quickly consumed with all of her past sins, her struggles in life, her heartaches, and memories that often plagued her when she would try to sleep at night. I also believe that as she lowered herself to the floor, face down in the presence of God, her heart broke for the disrespect that he was shown in this person's home. And her, her face fell downward toward the dirty feet of Jesus. I believe that her sin and her grief, it opened up a floodgate of tears that showered the feet of Jesus. And it had to have been so many tears dripping on the feet of Jesus that the woman was able to use them to completely wipe off and wash off the dust and animal dung from that day's long journey. As she looked at the streaks of cleanliness that her tears made on Jesus' feet, she looked around for a towel and, had, and saw none having no honor or authority to even ask a servant for a towel, yet alone the master. She dismantles her hair and used her glory to wipe the feet of Jesus. Church, make no mistake, it took humility for her to wipe the Lord's feet with her hair because the Psalms tells us that a woman's hair is her glory. So it was very important for that woman, her hair, to keep it clean. But the Bible says, she used it to wipe the feet of Jesus. With this act of worship, she took the disdain and public disrespect of that household away from Jesus, and she took it upon herself. She removed any evidence of his public rejection with her hair and took it as her own. Are we seeing a parallel here of what Jesus has done for us? Amen? She is humbled in the presence of God. She was humbled in the presence of God. So the truth is, church, when we come to God in worship with reverence and humility— there are some powerful things that take place. There are four things specifically that I want to highlight for you today. The first is that it positions us to align our hearts with God's will. We acknowledge his sovereignty. We submit ourselves to his plans and purposes for our lives. We come to God in reverence and humility, and it positions our, us to align our hearts to God's will. The second thing, it allows us to experience God's presence. And know how I long to be in the presence of God. When we approach him with humility, we recognize our need for him and we open ourselves up to his transforming presence in our lives. 
Here's the third thing that happens when we come to him in reverence and humility. It fosters a deeper relationship with God. Haven't you seen that, church, in your own life as you've pursued God, as you've grown in relationship with him, that it it fosters a deeper relationship with him? He is faithful in that to meet us where we are. So by humbling ourselves before him, we acknowledge his greatness and draw near to him, allowing him to draw near to us in return. Here's the last thing that it does, I believe. Reverence and humility pave the way for personal transformation. Praise be to God. As we humble ourselves before God, he works in us, molding us and shaping us into the likeness of Christ. So what does coming to God in reverence and humility look like? Those four things for sure happen. But what does it actually look like in our lives? What does that look like for you? For some of us here today, I think it means beginning our day with a prayer of surrender acknowledging our dependence on God and and inviting him to lead us throughout every day. And maybe for others of you in this space, it means pausing throughout your busy schedules to offer up prayers of gratitude, acknowledging him and thanking him for his faithfulness in our lives. Maybe it means approaching our work, our everyday work, our relationships with our family and our spouse to acknowledge him and humble ourselves, recognizing that we are nothing without God's grace and mercy. I want to invite us to think through this real quick. Can you imagine what our weekend church services would look like if during the week we all committed to relentlessly pursue these things? Can you imagine what would be possible in this space? That during the week we were so close to him that when we gather, our response was simply to praise God with everything we have. What would that look like? Maybe a better question for us today. I want to ask it. What is holding you back from giving God everything you have? Can I ask you, is it your past? Is it a current sin or struggle that you're going through? Is it a, is it a lack of trust and faith in God? If that's you today, I believe God wants you to hear this specific thing. God wants to meet you in that and reveal his goodness and faithfulness once again. He is faithful, church. He will meet you where you are every time and reveal himself to you. And I just want to be vulnerable for a moment because here I am, a pastor on the stage, giving examples of what might be going on in your life. I never want to give the picture that we as pastors have it all together. Can I be honest? I fail often. I often lose sight of putting God first in my worship. I think that's the case for all of us, isn't it? But despite our shortcomings and failures, hear this. We are called to continually strive for that deep connection with God. Church, don't be discouraged by your imperfections, but instead, let them serve as reminders of our constant need for his his grace and his mercy. And be be reminded that each time you come to God, he's going to meet you right where you are. Notice Jesus doesn't stop the woman in the story. He's like, no, you got to stop. You're not pure. You can't come to me. He doesn't say, no, 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 no. You have to do these five things before you can come to me because you aren't clean. What does he do? It says that he saw her broken heart and her desire to praise him despite her past. And he said, you are forgiven. Our God will always meet us with forgiveness, mercy, and love when we come to him with repentant and surrendering hearts. So church, it doesn't mean that we are going to get this perfect but it does mean that we are going to choose to faithfully seek after God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls, and we're going to surrender our will to him every day. Which brings us to our next truth today. Our second point, worship him with wholehearted extravagance. We are called like this woman to worship him with wholehearted extravagance. And, and I think we get a good understanding of what this actually means just by looking at what she did, her response to Jesus. But I do want to provide a definition for this, this truth. Wholehearted extravagance in worship is marked by a passionate pursuit of God. It's a willingness to go above and beyond in our worship expressions. I wonder if that woman tried some new things in her worship that day. And a fervent desire to honor and glorify him in all that we do. So to take another look at this, we're going to go back to the text, starting in verse 37. Would you follow along? A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. 
Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this, wo- if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. What I love about these few verses is that we realize that, that she learned where Jesus was. She knew where he would be. And she with relentless pursuit, chased after him and made a priority to get to him. What does she do? She shows up. She gets the courage to go into the home and she sees Jesus. She sees her savior and she notices that Jesus hasn't been given the respect he deserves. No one's bothered to wash this poor man's feet. So this woman's heart is moved and she decides to take action. She goes and wets his feet with her tears. She dries those tears with her hair. And this is really important what she does next. We're going to take a deeper look into this next part. After she dried the feet of Jesus with her hair, she kissed his feet as a sign of respect, honor, and reverence. And then she had brought with her one of her most costly possessions, an alabaster jar containing an expensive and precious perfume. She carefully broke open the alabaster jar and poured the perfume on his feet. Church, we have to take a close look at this alabaster jar. This act of worship was costly to this woman. You see, the alabaster jar itself was likely a valuable possession. And in biblical times, alabaster was a precious material often used to craft luxurious containers. And by breaking the jar open, which I have to highlight this because it's powerful, which only happened once for every woman. And she chose this moment. By breaking the jar open, Mary was essentially giving up something of great material worth. It represented a tangible sacrifice on her part. And the perfume within the alabaster jar was also incredibly costly. It wasn't just an ordinary perfume, my friends. It was an ointment. And other translations would tell us that. It was actually pure nard. It was rare. It was expensive. And it actually tells us that this would have been about a year's worth of wages that this woman was pouring onto the feet of Jesus. So breaking the alabaster jar and pouring out its content was not only a symbolic act of worship, but it was a tangible sacrifice for this woman. You see, it demonstrated her willingness to give up something precious for the sake of honoring and expressing expressing her love for Jesus. On this day, we learn that the woman demonstrated many amazing acts of worship. What did she do? We talked about it. She worshiped with reverence and humility. She worshiped with wholehearted extravagance And she worshiped with a sacrifice of praise, which brings us to our third fill-in on the note guide today, that we should worship sacrificially. This woman's act of worship came with a significant personal cost, as I've already shared. It required her to sacrifice the expensive jar of perfume, as well as her humility in kneeling to kiss, wash, and dry Jesus' dirty feet. But perhaps... The most profound sacrifice that day was enduring the scorn and rejection of the self-righteous Pharisees and other guests at the meal. With what we know now, church, do you think it's realistic that to believe that those present at the dinner party gave her dirty looks and looks of anger? Is it possible that they, they hurled insults at her? But to her, I love this, coming face to face with Jesus was worth it. It was worth all of those things. She knew that her sacrifice was worth it if it meant being close to Jesus. Our worship should cost us something. This idea is rooted in scripture time and time again. The reality is, is probably not every time it will feel like it costs us something. But if we look at our lives as a response to God in worship, and it never costs us anything, then I think, church, we need to examine. And this isn't just an idea that's coming from me on stage. It's rooted time and time again in Scripture. I want to read some of those passages to you. Romans 12, 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The next one, 1 Chronicles twenty two nineteen 19 says, Now give yourselves completely to obeying the Lord your God. And my personal favorite, I know a lot of you know this one, Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. 
If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Church, sacrificial worship, it might involve giving up personal comforts or conveniences for the sake of honoring God. You know, I've heard this, this awesome phrase by other pastors. You can look at your time, you can look at your talent, and you can look at your treasure to know what you prioritize in life. And Dara might even say that in some cases, you can look at your time, your talent, and your treasure to know what you worship. What about our time? Are we investing our time in activities that honor God? Or are we consumed by busyness? It's easy to wear that word busyness as a badge of honor in our culture, isn't it? And I hear it all the time and get it. I get it. I have a wife. I have four kids. We both work full time. I know what it means to be busy just like you. We are all busy. It's kind of what, the, what our culture has fed us, isn't it? And we wear it like a badge of honor. But I want to speak to this because if our busyness is hindering our ability to prioritize God and his kingdom, then church, it's become an idol in our lives. Let's invite God together. Let's invite God to lead us and help us prioritize our time in ways that honor him. What about your treasure? There's a reason why Jesus talks a lot about money and it offended a lot of people in scripture. Our financial investments reveal what we value and what we prioritize. It does. Are we putting God first in our finances? Are we directing our resources towards advancing God's kingdom? Church, together, let's examine and consider whether our spending reflects our commitment to God's work in this world. What about your talent? Church, I look across this room and I see men, women, and children created in the image of God who are designed to worship him. And I see gifts. Some of us have amazing spiritual gifts. Are we using these gifts to serve others and glorify God? whether it's serving here at church, like we talked about at the beginning of service, or being of Christ's love in our workplace and our communities, let's make ourselves available to be instruments of his grace and mercy every day. Church, our worship, it might cost you something. But here's the thing. Imagine the heart of God in that moment when one of his precious worshipers threw their life on the line as a sacrifice of his glory. And in a gruesome moment of decision, she actually chose his honor even over her own survival. Church, this story, it stirs my heart every time I read it. And I'm sure this woman is stirring your heart in this moment. But if it's affecting us in this way, imagine what effect it must have had on the heart of Jesus, her Savior which reminds us that our worship, it moves the heart of God. Your worship, it moves the heart of God. And listen, I get it. Maybe you've lost a loved one and you're here today. Maybe your marriage is broken. It's falling apart. Maybe you lost your job right after a big financial decision. Maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer or a disease that's making you rearrange your whole life. And some of you would even be here today and you're telling me, Pastor Luke, you keep talking about worshiping me with all that I have to surrender everything before God. I feel like I have nothing left. I don't know what else I have to give the enemy. It feels like he's robbed me of all joy, all material possessions. I don't know what I have left to offer. I simply don't have an answer for you, but Jesus does. Can I read it to you? Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you, it is light. Church, no matter what you have to offer, he just wants your heart. He wants you, all of you. He, he, he wants to have those moments of intimacy with you. And no matter our circumstances, we can and we are called to live a life full of worship to God. Why should we praise God? Because when we come to him, even in our weakness, our emptiness and brokenness, God shows up. Get an, let's get an amen going on in here. God shows up. He is faithful to show up. He meets us where we are and he fills us with his presence, his grace, and his love. Now, friends, what I find so beautiful about today's message on, on dwelling, dwelling with the Lord in worship is that it ties to every single week of this message, of this, of this uh, series. 
right? We certainly can worship through fasting, prayer, meditation, study, and rest. And you know what? Those are all acts of worship to God when we engage in them with wholehearted devotion and surrender. So I don't have this big so what moment for you guys today. But what I am asking you to do is look back. The Holy Spirit has certainly been speaking to me and I know he's been speaking to you. What of the, which one of those things is God asking you to take a closer look at and to practice? I want to ask you to look back. Reflect on what the Holy Spirit's been teaching you, convicting you of, or perhaps inviting you to draw closer to him in. Maybe for you today, God is simply challenging you to draw nearer to him through worship. And if you're unsure of how to do that, can we look back at what the, the woman with the alabaster jar did? I think that's our model today. Worship God with reverence and humility, humility, acknowledging his greatness and worthiness of honor. Worship God with wholehearted extravagance, giving him your best without reservation. Worship God sacrificially. Offer him your all, even if that all is, feels like very little. Give him your best without reservation and offer it to him just like he offered everything for you on the cross on Calvary. So church, as we close today, I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And I pray that we would even use these next few moments to worship him with everything we have, with hearts full of reverence, with wholehearted extravagance, with sacrificial love. And church, my prayer all week has been that as you leave this place today, that you would offer up your life to be a continuous offering of worship, bringing glory and honor to his name. Would you pray with me? Oh God, my heart longs for you. It yearns for you. God, I'm thinking of people in this space today that, that maybe it's been a while since they've sat in your presence and acknowledged what you're doing and sat in awe and wonder of your goodness. God, I believe that you don't distance yourself from us, but we distance ourselves from you. So God, may they draw closer to your heart today in these next few moments. Lord, yes, we want to live lives of worship, but may it start now. For those who have been running, may it start now that they seek your face, O God of Jacob. May it be now that they have an encounter that transforms them and draws them closer to your heart, God, so they can be transformed more and more into your image. God, I love this song we're about to sing to you, to your heart, that we're going to throw up our hands again and again, because all that I have is an endless hallelujah. All I have is a praise, God. So whatever that looks like for all of us, Lord, I pray that we would surrender at your feet, that we would give you our best praise, that we would give you everything we have in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Church, I invite you to stand. Let's sing together. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express? All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship.
worship you, yeah. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion. up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord oh, praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in and watching Heritage at Home, our TV broadcast. What an amazing time today as we worshiped God through song, as we declared his praises, lifting his name up. And what an amazing time as we opened the word of God and learned what it means to live a life of worship. Not just the songs we sing, but the very breath in our lungs that we pour out for the sake of praising the name of Jesus. Listen, my prayer for you, for those of you watching online and on TV, is that you would hear this word and that you would ask God, how am I called to live a life of worship for you, Jesus? And my prayer is that you would actually do that. You would, you would live out worship throughout your week, that you would do it at your, at your home, at your job, in your neighborhood, that you would be the feet of Jesus wherever you are, bringing praise to him. Church, with that being said, we would love to give you some next steps. That first next step might be filling out our virtual connect card found at the link below. That's just a way that we can get to know you, the way we can know how to pray for you and alongside you, and just journey with you in life. We would invite you to do that now. Another next step for you today um, could be giving. You know, God's doing amazing things here at Heritage. He's reaching a lot of people through this TV ministry. If you would like to give to that and give back to God, you can do that by clicking the link below. Well, church, what an amazing day of worship. We hope to see you here at Heritage at Home next week. Have a blessed and amazing week.